Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us today uh, for these training sessions. My name is Joseph Puckett here with Craig Wiggins Coaching and I'm super excited to welcome you to day one of the call. As an FYI, we're splitting this up over two days. There's so much information that Craig and Todd and I would like to share with y'all. We, excuse me, we had to split this up over two days. So be sure to come back Thursday, same time, same link. And we're going to be going over so much information. I hope that you're going to take a ton of notes because here's the sneak peek of all the stuff that we're going to be talking about today and Thursday. It's going to start at a very high level on your leadership for yourself, leadership within your team and the culture of your agency. We're gonna go into today more on recruiting and developing staff, how to compensate staff, setting goals for them, holding them accountable to things that you're trying to accomplish so that you can hit your goals. We want you to help, we wanna help you make 2022 your best year ever and really set your trajectory up for the next five, 10 years for success. That's all around building your team first then on Thursday, it's going to be more on marketing and processes, um, sales scripts, how to sell more regardless of price, especially in a challenging rate environment like many of us are seeing now. Uh, different lead sources, direct mail, life transfers, internet leads, read quotes, win backs, cross sales. We're going to hit it all on Thursday. And of course, all throughout these calls and at the end of each day, we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A. So please make this as interactive as you like. We have a ton of slides to get through, a ton of information to get through, but we want to have a lot of time for Q&A. And speaking of how we want to help you, I want to start this call with an offer, right? Just in case some of you guys needed to jump off or something, I would hate for you to miss a special offer to become a part of CWC. Hopefully you know a little bit about who we are, Craig Wiggins Coaching. Um, and, you know, this is some information on our program, our on-demand program. We have over 1,200 training videos. We do live training every single week, including role play. Over 100 documents and processes from sales scripts, service scripts, marketing plans and guides, agency handbooks, compensation plans. I can go on. We have webinars that are hosted by Craig and other mega agency <coughs> owners. Todd's done webinars for our members only. Um, other mega all-state and farmers agencies. Uh, have, have done those webinars, all, all for less than six bucks a day. It's literally $177 a month. That's it. Six bucks a day, less than six bucks a day for unlimited access, unlimited users, whether you have 10 users or two users or 20 users, it's, it's six bucks a day. But since we want to help you make 2022 an amazing year, if you use this promo code, the 2022 success promo code, you get the first month for 20 bucks and 22 cents. There's no contracts, no commitments. Cancel anytime. If we can help you, we would love to. That's the pitch. That's it. Everything else is here to help you. All right. So thank you guys. Check us out. CraigWilliamsCoaching.com slash on demand. I forgot to say that. Promo code is 2022 success. So before we talk about building your team, finding candidates, hiring candidates, developing leaders, developing your staff to reach their full potentials so that you can hit your goals. We want to talk about you first. Yeah. And, and what I want to talk about before we even get into this part is <clears throat> really just thanking Todd, you know, Todd and I, we both have groups on Facebook. We both work with a lot of agents around the country and I just admire Todd and his willingness to try to help people. Right. And that's really kind of how this whole webinar came about is that, there's a lot of people out there that they need a lot of help. They need help, you know, getting wherever they are now to the point they're trying to get to. And there's some folks that are, that are really struggling and they could just use a little bit of help to get over that hump. And that's exactly what we want to try to try to deliver today. So I appreciate Todd joining us. appreciate him helping um, great friend and just does a great job of, of helping a lot of agents around the country. And look, before we get into building your, your team, your leadership as an owner, this is the most, critical part of it, right? You've got to be a good leader. Um, we can talk about recruiting and comp plans and all those kind of things, but the best agencies that we work with, and we work with a ton of them all around the country, the one thing that the best ones have in common is they're great leaders. You know, they, they can motivate team members. They can solve problems. They can lead by example. They do all these things that help put them in a position, you know, so they're successful, so it has to start there. You got to really kind of know your role and you've got to own everything. You know, you can't make excuses for things when, when things go poorly. Um, I say this all the time that every single agency out there, including yours, is designed perfectly 
to get the exact results that you're getting, right? So whatever results you're getting, it was designed perfectly to get those results and you're the one that designed it. So the great thing about that, if you're not getting the results you're looking for, then you know you, you can change the design. You're the one that designed it to begin with. So now you can change it and maybe you'll pick up some things that we're going to talk about today, you know, to make that happen. So you got to own everything. Stop making excuses. Stop pointing the finger. Everything is exactly the way it is because of the, of the mistakes, the choices, the decisions that you have made. And you learn from all of that. And that's exactly, you know, how we got together. I know Todd's been down that same road, all great leaders. That's exactly what, you know, what, what they have done. And I will say this, that it never gets easy, but it definitely gets easier. The more choices and decisions you make, the more mistakes you make, the more you learn from those things that don't go the way you want them to go, the easier it gets. You know, when, when you're hesitant about making choices, about making decisions, about doing things, you know, in the moment, um, it just kind of drags it out and makes it a lot harder. So own everything from the beginning, learn from what you're doing as you go. And over time, it'll, it'll definitely help you. And a lot of times, you know, when people think about agency culture and they think about the results of that agency, I like this, this, this illustration here gives you a really good example. You know, they think about the fruit. They think about the results. They think about what they're getting every day in production. But it's all those other things that go into that, right? The culture, the operating principles, you know, the, the core values, the beliefs, the mission of, of that agency. That's what ultimately leads to the results, so sometimes we have to kind of understand we need to focus on those things just as much, if not more, than we do the results. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. When it comes to culture, culture trumps everything, right? You got to have non-negotiables in place, you know, where, where you have things in place that you just don't negotiate on. People steal, lie, cheat, falsify, gossip. That's one of our non-negotiables. We've actually fired you know, people that wrote over 100 policies a month because they gossiped about somebody else. And we do that <clears throat> to make sure that our culture doesn't cause us problems. You know, culture is, is, is going to make or break your agency. And every time you're faced with a decision, that should be the first thing you think about is, does this affect my culture in a negative way? And then you act on that accordingly. So having non-negotiables is huge. Talks to people, you know, they got to go. You can't allow people to, to dictate the way that your business is run uh, when they're toxic, you know, you just, you got to deal with that. Don't let them hold you hostage, deal with those people, move on. There's a great book called Radical Candor. If you've never read this book, I highly recommend it. It's a great read by Kim Scott. Um, you can go on Amazon and read it. And it's going to explain these four quadrants of, of leadership and how people work with folks. And Radical Candor is really all about challenging people um, professionally while you show that you care about them personally. And that sounds a lot easier than it really is. Read this book. Go get this book. You know, pay attention to the, to the lessons. The first part of it's a little bit boring, but the back part is really, really good. And it will help identify you know, yourself and anybody else on your team. What kind of leader are you and what you could do differently? This plays a huge role in the overall success of your agency. Again, processes, those are great. Comp plans are great. Lead sources, all those things are great. If I don't have a good leadership, if I don't have good leadership in place, you know, it's going to be really difficult to get where I want to go. So this is, I'm not a big, you know, you got to read a book kind of, a you know, book a week kind of guy. I'm not, I'm not that way, but this is definitely one of my favorite business books of all time. And really it's, it's about this. Do you want to be cool mom or do you want to be head coach? Right. We're obviously big Bama fans, but who do you think is going to get the more, more out of somebody? Is it going to be cool mom, the one buying them beer on Friday nights or the guy that's just challenging them, right. And trying to make them be somebody <clears throat> reach your full potential, right? So we that's that's what we want everybody to strive to be is, is, is that person that gets into radical candor where you're challenging people professionally, you show that you care about them personally. That's just, that's a huge part of it. The other thing that I think is really important is you got to have balance. You got to have balance in, in your life and the way you run your business, the people that are on your team. I think everybody has to have balance. And just really quickly, before I get Todd in here, um, I want to talk about this. Being where your feet are, <clears throat> that's the key to having balance. And I learned this lesson years ago, uh, playing football. I'm on a football field. I'm in line for a drill. We're supposed to be paying attention to the coach. We're supposed to be paying attention to the drill. We're not. We're goofing off. And out of the right side of my face mask, I see this big paw come in and grab my face mask. And he throws me down on the ground. It's Coach Posey, our defensive coordinator. 
And he grabbed me, to the, threw me to the ground, grabbed my two friends, threw both all three of us to the ground, right? And you could do that back then. They wouldn't, they wouldn't do anything. Now you get arrested for that. But he said, you got to hit it, guys. And it meant it was time to run, time to run around the track. So run around the track while everybody's practicing. And uh, it's hot, it's two a days in the middle of August. Come back in when practice is over. <clears throat> he looks at this and said, guys, you got to learn to be where your feet are. And really didn't understand what he was saying, and he knew that. He's like, look. When you're in the classroom, you got to study. When you're in the weight room, you got to lift. When you're on this practice field, you got to practice. And that always just stuck with me. And it does to this day, you know, in business, whether it's with yourself, people that are on your team. A lot of times people that have, you know, there's no balance in their life because they're not where their feet are. They're not paying attention to their kids at home because they're worried about what's happening at the office. They're not successful at the office because they're thinking about things going on in their life. You know, always be where your feet are. Give 100% to that moment in time of wherever you are, and you're much more likely to, you know, to see success. So I think that's just a, a huge part, um, you know, of being a great leader is being where your feet are, allowing your people and your team to do the same. And those are just some key fundamental things of, of building your team. So, you know, I wanted to cover that before we got into actually building the team and talking about your business. Um, I'm going to let Joseph kind of run through some of these things. Then we're going to get Todd in here to talk about, you know, some of his experiences and what he's doing right now, especially with his protege program. Yeah. So your opportunity, y'all, in 2022 is massive. Whether you're with farmers, all state, independent, other captives, mm -hmm. things are changing. Things are changing, right? Your comp plan is changing. Your opportunity is changing. That cheese is being moved, right? Goals are increasing and it's challenging right now, but there's so much opportunities. I want to encourage you guys to do everything that you can to maximize your opportunity. It's sad sometimes for me as a coach and a mentor and a trainer, when I talk with an owner that's been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years, and they're only a couple of million dollars in premium. And they basically have created themselves a decent job. You have the opportunity to create a business that prints money while you sleep. You want to travel to Turks and Caicos with Todd and his beautiful wife. I don't know how he got that wife. Y'all look him up on Facebook. You'll know He's what I mean. a closer. I don't know He's how he did it. You want to travel the world. You want to own other businesses. You want to hunt and fish or have you know farms. You have that opportunity here. Make sure that you're not wasting another day wasting another month, wasting another year, not maximizing your opportunity. If you're having great success, that's awesome. But are you reaching the fullest potential to get the biggest bonuses, the biggest variable compensation that you have at your uh, carrier with your opportunities? Maximizing your compensation and bonuses is critical. Never leave a penny of your carrier's money on the table. You put it on your table. All right, but how are we gonna do that? We gotta write more business. How are we going to do that? We got to have the right people in place. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And then on Thursday, it's going to be about marketing and sources and things like that. Managing your expenses. It's all about the bottom line. I've been on trips with people before with Allstate, because that's who Craig and I are with. Todd's with Farmers. We're with Allstate. Um, and, you know, their net income wasn't as representative of that trip, Right. Guys, at the end of the day, it's not about trips. It's not about recognition. It's not even about hitting certain levels of, you know, um, things and awards. All that truly matters is your bottom line. Managing your expenses is very, very, very important and your, and your net income. If you spend $150,000 to make $100,000, that's not good. What we're going to do is we're going to teach you how to get more from what you currently have. Maybe even spend a lot less on marketing and leads, get more from what you currently have and get more from your team is really, really important. Um, investing in your team is extremely important since you can generate more sales, more revenue per person. You know, Craig here at this location is what, close to $30 million at just this agency that we're sitting in today. There's like 10 people here total. We got like five CSRs, five salespeople, a manager, that's it. That's super duper lean. How is he able to do that? How are we able to help agencies all across the country become more lean and more profitable by getting more from each person? I promise you that your staff are capable of more than what they're doing, but they need the roadmap. They need the training. They need the resources. They need the scripts and talk paths. They need to hear it from other people, not just you, right? Maybe when you were growing up, your mama and daddy would tell you something like, oh, mom, that's dumb. That's, that's, that's stupid. I'm gonna wear this shirt. I think it looks good. And then your friend's like, why are you wearing that shirt, right? Oh, no, my mama made me wear it. Sometimes your staff hearing from our staff 
See, that's what's cool about our training videos. It's not just some nerd at home office with an MBA who's never spent a day in an agency doing training. Not knocking those people. I'm sure they're great. But what's powerful about our training videos and our platform is it's our staff teaching how they work win backs, cross sales, requotes, internet leads, how they overcome objections, how they sell more coverages regardless of price. Um, being decisive, making decisions. Would you want to hit your, on that? <clears throat> yeah, look, I think you've got to be decisive. I have a saying that the, the, the streets of life are paved with flattened squirrels that couldn't make a decision, right? Because they just had to figure out whether to go left or right, and they couldn't, and, and now they're dead. So you've got to be decisive. And, and being decisive, let's say you make a decision and it, it doesn't work out. You still are moving forward, hmm. right? Either you, it's a good decision and you, and you make a great decision and, you, and you're winning or you're learning. But either way, the people that are not decisive, that kind of sit on things and wait and wait and wait, all they're doing is delaying their progress. So you've got to be decisive. You've got to make good decisions. Just look at the information you got in front of you, which is the best route to take. Take it, move on. And if it doesn't go well, then you pick up and you, and you learn from that and, and move forward. And lastly, and then we're going to introduce Todd. And I want to hear Todd's story on how he has developed over, over the years, positioning yourself for acquisitions and mergers. For those of you that are with Allstate or Independence and maybe other carriers that are allowing mergers, acquisitions, that's the quickest way to scale. The quickest way to scale is Todd is going to tell us how he built a $10 million personal lines book plus several million dollars in commercial premium all in one location at Farmers. That's not very common in a, no. just a short amount of time. He's going to tell us that now. But for those of you that have the potential now or maybe even the future to acquire, to merge, that is a very, very quick way to grow to scale. And with scale, you can do so much more. But I want to bring Todd on now. Can you tell us more of your story, more of your background, more of your history with farmers and how you've built one of the most successful and fastest growing agencies in the country? Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, guys, for 20 bucks to access their platform is insane. So <laughs> like I always tell people the the whole freemium model is getting overlooked like crazy. How much access people have to high quality content right now versus when I started back in 09 is just mind blowing to me if I had these kinds of resources at my fingertips. Right. I was I was busy trying to chase Grant Cardone's 10x program back then. <laughs> that had nothing to do with the real world of what we're doing in insurance, really, uh, and building an agency. So I, um, my whole background, I was a banker, uh, started at Compass Bank. I, I grew to being number two in the nation as a financial advisor with, with Compass Bank. And I'll never forget uh, a buddy of mine who started a farmer's agency came in and after he had quit, he went and started his own farmer's agency. He came in six months later and he shows me his, his pay that he made in six months. And he was already making way more money than I was at the bank. And I'm number two in the nation for investments. And this guy in six months, like is blowing me out of the water. I go, okay, I, I gotta, I gotta go start a business for myself. Like that was the most eye-opening moment that I had is if I want to be successful in life and really, you know, put all this effort and energy into really building something for myself and my family, we have the best opportunity that there is. No matter how many problems, how many times they move the cheese, right? If you build your systems and processes and, and really dial it in to where you can step away and go to the Turks and Caicos and have a good time for a week and your business is still operating at peak performance, I mean, that's the, that's the ultimate dream in my scenario, right? So it didn't start that way. Um, I actually joined farmers back in 09 it was one of the worst times i'll never forget at the texas mega conference is what they called it i was sitting in the back because i'm one of those uh people i don't like all the attention and i'm three months into my career with farmers and i turned to my right because they started playing some weird music and there was a black coffin coming down the hallway and apparently it was like death to 2009. It was the worst year farmers had ever had. And imagine being a new person, seeing a coffin coming down the hallway. I was thinking, I am screwed. What the hell is going on here? I join a cult or something. But, you know, what I really, what I learned quickly is that I tried to, I tried to go and do everything my district manager had told me to do. 
And like you were talking about the, the people in the ivory tower have never been an agent before. I was being told to go and do pizza parties at apartment complexes. I was told to go build networking relationships, which works in some places, but in my area, I, I was getting my butt kicked and stomped on. And here I am on a new comp plan. And so, uh, you know, you, new comp plans for new agents, you gotta be day one writing new business like crazy. I had no marketing dollars at the time. So like every bit of information that I was receiving was the opposite of what I should have done in that scenario, in that, in that setup. So I quickly learned, you know, how to scale my, my marketing. Um, and I struggled for quite a bit on learning how to build a team because I'd never been a leader before. I'd always worked for somebody. I'd always been the employee. And so really driving in, in over a hundred and something amount of people that have hired and fired over the years, I learned a lot and I still have a ton of learning to do. In fact, 2022 for me is going to be all about leadership learning, going to seminars, reading books. Like that is probably, I would say, my my weakest element that I have is, is leadership skills. So I'm I'm excited to learn more about, you know, what you guys offer and, and learning about that. So really, it took me a long time. It took me a lot of ups and downs. I went through every kind of marketing business model that you could put together, whether it was telemarketing, direct mail, internet leads networking. I tried everything. And ultimately, at the end of the day, what I found was it's having the right people and the right systems in place. Once you set those things up, which is, is easier if you have mentorship, uh, like, like you guys offer, much easier that you don't have to make the same mistakes, less time to set it up. But really, this business is, it gets easier, right? The, the, more, the more you realize that it's just about the people in the process, and you have no control over rates, so you just sell what's on sale, it, it's, it becomes a lot easier to manage and maintain, I would say. So I, I, I would agree with that 100%. I think that so many people have focused on things that, number one, out of their control, right? Like rates, you know, guidelines, even the economy, those kind of things. But you're right, man. Once you kind of get over that hump of hiring those first few people, and frankly, taking maybe a deep look at yourself in terms of what you're doing to help them be successful. And you start working through those mistakes, uh, especially if you have somebody to help you along the way, you know, a mentor of some sort, it, it does get easier. I don't think it ever gets easy because you're always dealing with people and you can't control their actions or their decisions, those kind of things. But being able to identify what's coming and, you know, deal with that quicker, it certainly gets easier over time. And people make this, sometimes a lot harder than it needs to be, but sometimes it's because they're not accountable to themselves. They're not disciplined, right? They do the things that they feel like doing. So the things that they should be doing. And that just inevitably delays a lot of these things. And meanwhile, they're, they're blaming other people, right? And you, and you can't do that. So you got to own the situation and look at what you have in front of you. And I think once you start controlling or, or looking at the things you have control over, a lot of the fear and anxiety you have around this whole business and industry as, as a whole, it just goes away because now you see things that you can do things about, right? And you put your energy there and you start getting these wins and these little wins end up being, you know, big wins. And all of a sudden you're having, you know, huge results. So I think you're spot on with that for sure. A uh, follow-up question, Todd, specifically, how many staff do you have? What are they write in terms of business? And what are your top lead sources? How, how, how did you get this $10 million empire in the past 12 years? So right now I have four full-time producers. Uh, I have that new protege that we're going to talk about that I hired on. And then I have three full-time CSRs. So uh, I know over the next three to four months, I'm probably going to reduce headcount. Um, just because there's some radical changes that need to take place. You know, that's um, one of the main things that I'm going to be focusing on is one leadership, but hold, holding my staff accountable and really, um, you know, in this business and we've, we've always got to get leaner and meaner, right? And, and, and holding accountable. And I've, I've allowed some things to go on within my office because I set it up on autopilot for a few years. And now I'm getting back and, and revamping and, and really diving in to take care, uh, take advantage of some variable comp op opportunities that has, has come my way, but really getting in and diving in. And maybe I'll probably have instead of eight, 
maybe six and a half. I don't know. Um, so the marketing things that I've done to get to this size was number one, I was really big into telemarketing. So I figured out how to take these internet leads, put them into a dialing system, um, really get people on the phone, handing those leads off to a producer to close. So really high volume internet lead slash cold calling, um, always having somebody talking to somebody, asking them for a quote, right? So just constant volume of telemarketing. And then what I realized is that because I don't get to control rates, and having a low intent lead volume, something like telemarketing, uh, it requires a lot of headcount. So I decided to entertain direct mail and then found out I was a lot better than the other people at direct mail um, and, and knew how to get people to call me better. And so I, I decided to start my own direct mail company. And um, so I do a lot. I probably send out about 50,000 mail pieces a month for myself right now in my mail company. And you know, that feeds my, my four producers and protege. Uh, and now I'm just subsidizing low volume months like your November, December, and uh, May. I know those are the three months in direct mail where my volume is going to be lower. So I'll have my marketer really, you know, dial up internet leads those months. And so it's just, just learning how the ebb and flows of, of what works when um, to feed my sales machine that I have going on. And just a quick plug, smarketingmail.com. Marketing mail, but with an S. I don't know why, you, where'd you come smarter. up with that name? We smarter, smart. okay, smarter marketing mail. So smarketingmail.com, we use your program. It's fantastic. Number one lead source for probably the last two years, you know, and look, you got to do it right. Now we're going to talk about lead sources a lot more on Thursday. Yep. Direct mail is not just a, hey, I'm just going to sign up for direct mail at my company and I'm going to do direct mail and that solves your problem. We'll get into a lot more specifics around that because it's got to be done the right way. Um, Todd, Brittany, their whole group over there, they, they do a fantastic job with that. So if you're not involved in that. And as things move forward, especially the phones and live transfers, and all those kind of things get harder and harder. Direct mail is, is definitely is definitely a way to go. So we'll, we'll spend some time on that on, um, on Thursday for sure. And Ryan just asked, what is the web address? So it's smarketingmail.com. Awesome program. Todd and his team are fantastic. Yep. Let's talk further about getting more from your team, training and developing your team and how important that is. Y'all, training should never take a day off. Daily training and development should never take a day off. What's cool is, is our program has over 1,200 training videos. That's enough to watch three, four or five videos every single day. And they're learning more and more and more as they go on throughout the year. And we're constantly adding more and more content. So members in our program get to utilize us for daily training. But your role in holding your team meetings individual coaching sessions, listening to recorded calls. Will you talk for a little bit about the importance of developing their team? And that's how you can get so much more from each person. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think a lot of times people, you know, they view training as something that they just, you know, they'll kind of do when they get to it and, you know, they have to do it. And so they'll, they'll, they'll make some time here or there, but it's not really like the, the focal point of what they're all about. And, it needs to be, you know, years ago when we took it, we started taking it really serious here um, long before CWC or really anybody was doing any of this kind of stuff. It's like, man, we just got to spend more time with these people that matter so much, right? Like I looked at the agency and this is probably true for Todd, maybe anybody else on the call. Your agency is probably the largest asset you own. And if it's not, it probably will be one day. The people that are in that agency, they're the most important part of that. You know, I say all the time that you, you build the people and then they build the agency, right? So you got to spend time with those folks and teach them what they need. You know, start by raising your standards. A lot of times agencies have standards that are just way too low. They think that, a, you know, a handful of new business items every month is, is acceptable and people can do a lot more. You're really cheating them as well as yourself by not having higher standards and pushing people to be the best that they can be. But you get there through training, you get there through development, you get there through, you know, a consistent approach to intentionally helping people learn new things. And it doesn't happen overnight. You know, it takes a while with some people. Sometimes it takes, you know, months to get through to somebody to really get them to understand, look, this is the way you've got to handle this. Um, but they carry that skill set with them for the rest of their career. And as long as you're constantly reinforcing it and working with them, 
Um, it's amazing the results that you can get out of folks. I and mean, we've seen tremendous results from, you know, obviously our team members, but people from all over the country and all different markets um, where if they take it serious, it makes a huge, huge difference. And I know Todd, you know, right now, let's talk about this for a second. He's got somebody, you know, in his office that's in the protege program, right? And I really wanted Todd to kind of share some, um, some things he's learning that not only could help maybe somebody else that has a protege in, in, their, in their office as well, but the lessons that can be learned that could apply to themselves, their current team, people that they're going to be hiring. What are some of those things that you're seeing? Because I've seen some of the posts you've made, and we've talked about this a little bit ourselves. But can you share with everybody, what are some lessons that maybe sometimes people don't even think anything about that you've got to get right in order for people to be successful? Yeah, the I've always been hesitant of a protege program because essentially what you're doing is getting somebody to copy you and become a competitor in your market, right? <laughs> like, I, I didn't understand that, but I know there's a couple of farmers agents in, the, in our company that have scaled some mega books off just using proteges. Uh, because it, just because you're running with a protege doesn't mean at the end of the day, they're going to leave you and go start their own agency. Maybe they stick with you as a producer because they're doing so well under your, your efforts and they see what you're doing and how much headache and, uh, you know, you have to do on a daily basis. Maybe they don't go be a protege. So at the end of the day, um, either way, I feel like it's a win-win, but something that it's really helped me understand. And I'm, I'm going to try to relate for a lot of agents on, on the call is whenever you add a new person to your office, I feel like there's some expectations because of lack of systems and processes or lack of marketing. I feel like there's unrealistic expectations that's always put on new, new employees. If, for example, a protege to me is a sales producer who's going to learn how to run and manage an office, right? Like all we have to do is learn marketing and how to be a great leader and a little bit of service work because we're focused mainly on new business and boom, you got an agency, right? Um, what I found with the protege, when I brought them in, I wanted to uncover what did they know? What did they not know? And so I, I wrote down on the board, you know, marketing, service, sales, product, and I can't remember the fifth one, but basically all of the, all of the elements of an agency. And I asked them, you know, from one to five, Name, name, number one is your strongest to number five is your weakest. Um, organize those for me on, on kind of where your skill sets are as a person. And that's really how I started the, the path with them to figure out, hey, what do we need to focus on first? And there's a trick there. Uh, if he wouldn't have told me marketing was his number one thing, I would have made it his number one thing, right? Because if you don't know how to acquire customers, you do not know how to run an insurance agency. Let's just we're all about new business sales, right? So that was like kind of the, the underlying foundational element of when I was getting into the protege program, I needed to make sure this protege knew how to acquire customers. And if they don't know how to acquire customers, I'm not doing him uh, a justice of teaching him how to actually make us a, a successful insurance agency work, right? There, of course, other things are really important too, as far as leadership's processes and all that, all those other things. But I really felt like marketing was the number one thing that I needed to dive into with him. And so as I was, as I brought on the protege, we figured out, you know, basically put him on the same comp plan that we'll go over. You guys will go over as my other producers and, you know, started product training day one. We had some issues with technology and, and our mothership. I took a uh, two weeks to get him logged into training, which that was fun, um, you know, get him through product training. But really what, how I, how I look at a new protege coming in is it's from day one, we got to get you marketing and selling, right? And you're going to do a lot of those things. I'm going to make you be a master of all. So like an example would be when I started my agency, I did cold calling for a month and I'll tell you what, I'll never do it again. Like, <laughs> I'd, I'd rather go get a sign and say, I oh, will work for beer on the corner, right? Like, <laughs> I, will, I won't do it again, but I, but I mastered it. So if I had to give my protege like a piece of advice is do not require someone else in your office to do a job you have not mastered. Hmm. And there's a, there's a certain level, and I don't care if you hate it. I don't like, 
And if you do hate it, you got to be very cautious about how you tell your employee, you like my marketer, I never told them I hated it. Like, this is the worst thing ever. Like, you don't do that to your people, right? You motivate them and encourage them. But I wanted to make sure that the protege knew that every single job in the office, you must be a master of it. Even if you're not good at it, you still need to master it, right? Because only then when you go and you're a coach, will you understand their struggles, what they're going through, and whether the excuses they're feeding you are relevant or not. Um, and so... I could go on for, for hours about, you know, all the steps, but that was the initial thing is I, I wanted to understand where they're coming from, their experience, let's rank it, and then really dive into marketing and becoming a master of marketing. Very good. Well, let's, let's talk about actually building the team because I know a lot of people, they're trying to figure out, you know, how do we do that? How do I recruit? You know, how do I pay them? What, what does all that look like? How do I hold them accountable? Um, so Joseph, let's walk them through the actual recruiting process. You know, there's a lot of different strategies that you can that you can utilize, and we'll spend some time talking on this and and get Todd to weigh in as well. Yeah, so here's some things that we're going to go over. Indeed, resume search alerts, which is by far my favorite way to find candidates. I'm going to talk about that on the next slide. Job ads. I honestly, I'm trying. I'm trying to remember. I really can't remember the last time we hired someone that applied. It's mainly us mm -hmm. reaching out to candidates on Indeed resume search alerts, which I'm going to talk about the next slide, or by using a company like Team Hired. Mm -hmm. We love Team Hired. I'm not sure if you guys are all aware who they are, but you can check them out, teamhired.com. They actually do virtual recruiting events, bring candidates to you. You do a Zoom type session and a group setting, figure out which ones that you want to take to have individual conversations with. It's a fantastic company, great vendor of ours. We use them religiously to help build our team. Also leveraging social media. Um, we've shared videos. And mm -hmm. by the way, on our platform, we have a 14 page packet, which breaks down our entire hiring process. I'm going to go through several things now, but we just don't have time to go through it all. But there's a page in there on ads and, and things that we used in social media, video tours of the office, interviews with current staff, stuff like that. Um, you can make it fun. You could TikTok it, right? You could TikTok it. I'm not a TikTok y dancey type of guy like Daniel Austin or Nick Saka with Allstate. Farmers probably has some cool TikTokers. But you got to go out there, let these candidates know that you're um, a fun place to work, great environment. Y'all, we're literally selling products that people are required by law to have. <laughs> They're required mm -hmm. to have auto insurance by law. They're required to have property insurance by contract, right? This is an easy job, right? Working nine to five, no nights, no weekends, no holidays in an air-conditioned environment, <laughs> but using a phone to make unlimited income, selling a product that people are required to have, right? Let the community know that you're open for business and that you're looking. So leveraging social media, but investing in a program like Team Hired or Indeed Resume Search Alerts to, to open up to more candidates, I think it's important. Referrals, referrals from current team members. Uh, sometimes we would get package deals, right? I would recruit, be recruiting one team member from another um, company or whatever. And I would always ask, always ask for referrals, especially if you like them. If you don't like them, I don't really want to know who they know because people flock together, right? Birds of a feather flock together. But if I like somebody, I got plenty of package deals over the years mm -hmm. and I would get two or three hires from just one interview, right? So referrals from current staff, active recruiting in the community, you know, as you're out and about shopping, Y'all, can you think of anything worse than being in retail right now, right? After Black Friday, you got Christmas coming up, working nights, weekends, all that kind of stuff. Um, out and about eating, restaurants. Craig hired a, a photographer, right? He was getting headshots done. And Tyler, who's been with us now for 15 years, who's been with Craig for 15 years, he was a photographer. And he was doing a great job upselling packages to this family with a crying kid. And he recruited him away. We hired someone that was a referral from one of our customers. She worked at a tanning salon and was our first 100 item a month producer. And she was working at a tanning salon, just hadn't really found what she wanted to do professionally a couple of years after college. So active recruiting in the community, letting your customers know all that kind of stuff. But, you know, in 2021 and the age of the pandemic, remote question mark, maybe you'll hit that. Yeah, remote is, <clears throat> look, I think that, it's, it's probably the way of the future for a lot of people, and you can't get behind on this. The last five producers we've hired have all been remote. 
and they work all over the country. And yes, it's a little more complicated with the equipment, you know, and, and uh, training, getting up speed. But so many people are just expecting the ability, the flexibility to work remotely. So you need to start thinking about that, you know, and we actually have some some content, some webinars that we've done, some, some chapters on our program that sp specifically revolve around hiring remotely. I would highly encourage you to look at that and start thinking about that. Is that, is that a solution for you? Um, the thing with recruiting that, you know, Joseph just kind of went over for all these things is you got to be doing everything, right? There's not like one silver bullet. And right now, this labor market's probably the toughest that, that I've ever seen it um, in terms of just getting people just to show up you know, getting them to, to reply and that type of thing. So you got to lay it all out there. And he's talking about Tyler been with us for 15 years. He literally came while we were out and about. So, you know, think about that when you're out and about and you see people and they're doing a great job, you know, make sure that you offer the opportunity to talk with them. You know, Hey, I think you'd have a lot more fun, you know, working in my agency than you would working at this, at this store at 10 o'clock at night on a Saturday. So um, Todd, you want to weigh in on this? I know recruiting is, it's a huge issue for a lot of people and it's becoming, seems like a bigger and bigger problem as, as days go by with fast food restaurants offering huge bonuses and that type of thing. What are you doing to try to attract candidates? So I am about to engage team hired. Uh, I talked to him, them at your CDWC event that, awesome. that we had. So, um, I, I would say with, with two things with recruiting, I've always had success getting referrals from social media people, or um, I've never, I've never had success with Indeed. So I'm, ex I'm, I'm interested to hear about that one, but either referrals or referrals from staff, because I'll give my staff because they know my expectations and I've gotten some really good referrals from my staff in, in hiring. Um, and with re regards to remote work, technology is there to make that work. Mm -hmm. If your leadership isn't there, and your managerial skills of listening to calls isn't there, you're not ready for it. Correct. Right. So I would tell people remote is the future, but if you can't hold yourself accountable to what's required of being a good leader and managing the processes that are required, if you can't even do it when they're in front of you, uh, I don't know how you're going to do it when they're remote. Right. So, and then it just requires a, somebody who's, um, you know, they're, I call them my unicorns, but they're out there you know, somebody who is self, can self-manage their time. Um, you know, you're not going to walk behind them and they're on Facebook in the office, right? So somebody, somebody is, who is very money motivated and you work a comp plan that makes sense for them and for you, and you're a good uh, steward of, of tracking and being a good leader, I 100% agree that remote is the best way to do it only because, well, not only because, but because it's it's less overhead right like you don't have to have a desk you don't have to have a, a roof um so it, it's definitely something that i am going to be looking into more and more also something to note is like texas pretty big state and i know in austin right now we're pretty competitive on rates versus where i'm at here in dallas fort worth i'm looking to hire a remote remote person person down in the austin area um, and use a virtual office where you can rent by the hour an office if somebody requires, you know, or requests an in-person meeting with the producer. So um, really helping expand my footprint without expanding my overhead of having a physical office location. Yeah, and also expanding your ability to pull candidates, right? Because a lot of times folks are so limited within their, their geographical area with their city or their town and there's just not a huge pool of people to pull from, or maybe the cost of living is really expensive where you live and you can go and recruit someplace else where it's much lower. So um, I think Todd is, is 100% correct. It's, it's the way of the future, but you have to be ready for it as a leader. You've got to be able to have the things in place um, to hold people accountable and, and to make sure they're doing what they need to be doing so it's a profitable relationship and not one where you know, it's a failure. Well, let's talk for just a few minutes about Indeed resume search alerts. We don't have time right now for me to walk you through the entire process. The good news is for those of you on our program, there's a 16 minute video. It's chapter four of the hiring process course where I actually show how to find candidates. So I'm just going to kind of talk you through it at Indeed.com slash resumes. Indeed.com slash resumes. You can actually go in right now and search for Allstate, State Farm, Farmers, 
PNC, property and casualty. You can search for all these, can I move my mouse up here? All these various keywords and within a certain radius of a certain zip code or city. So if I'm trying to find people with Allstate experience, for example, or someone that worked at Farmers or, or at a tanning salon, I can search for all those keywords, maybe even if they just have sales, marketing, whatever, telemarketing. I can search for those keywords, find resumes with those keywords within a certain radius of that location. I can then subscribe to by clicking the button that to get new resumes for the search by email. And every single morning, every single morning for each keyword, I get one email with up to 20 resumes in it. And I can quickly skim through it and say, okay, this person works at Subway. This person works at Walmart. This person's a truck driver. This person's an office manager at the state farm down the street. I'm reaching out to that person, right? So I can see all those things in my inbox by subscribing to those alerts. And there is a cost for it. It's $250 a month to reach out to a hundred contacts or, um, Keep in mind when you reach out to a, a con, uh, excuse me, a, a candidate with this example template over here to the right. I have this little template, and this is in our 14 page hiring process packet. And it's talking about, you know, your agency, talking about the opportunity. You're selling them, y'all. You have to sell people to come work for you. Gone are the days of you sitting back in your leather chair saying, Why do you want to work here? Right? We have to sell these people, they have options. People have options now. So little resume email that we send out, when they click to reply, if they say, hey, I'm not interested in working for Todd, you actually get a credit back. If they click, yeah, I'm interested in talking to Todd, he gets two credits back now. So now he can reach out to two more people. So you pay the money, you can pause the subscription at any time. It doesn't have to keep going on and on and on perpetually, but always be recruiting. I kind of liken it to this. If your business relied on you seeing shooting stars, right? But you only look up in the sky for 10 minutes a month, you're not going to have a very good business. Having your Indeed resume search alerts turned on where those shooting stars are hitting your email inbox every single morning, you're going to see more people. You're going to miss candidates if you're only looking when you need it. And by the way, we shouldn't just hire when we need somebody. In fact, that's the worst time to hire. Todd used to work at a bank. He was on the investment side. I used to work at Regions Bank. We were Com Compass's competitor. Regions Bank on the retail side. You know, the worst time to ask for a loan is when you need one. <laughs> Yeah. The worst time to hire is when you're desperate, right? I need to hire. I need somebody. I joke with people that I mentor and they say, but I need somebody. Right? I just need somebody. I was like, I'll come up there and sit. If you just want a warm seat and a, and a, and a pulse, I'll come up there and sit and, and collect a paycheck. No, always be recruiting. Indeed, resume search alerts. Fantastic. Absolutely love it. Any thoughts? Yeah, the only thing I would add to that, you know, when he talks about always selling people, you know, it is important that you sell them. You know, you got to sell them on the next step of the mm -hmm. process. You always want to make sure that they're a good fit before you start selling them. So we don't want to just sell to everybody that comes in and applies. You know, we, we got to make sure we follow the process. But he's right. You know, the, the, the options people have today. I love mm -hmm. when people, you know, they give millennials a hard time. Millennials just have options and they know it and they exercise them and they're not afraid to exercise them. So we have to understand that, you know, when, when they have all these different ways that they can make a living now and all the different things that they can do, and you're in the insurance business and you already have these hoops to jump through with licensing and everything required just to be able to come in and be, you know, be legal, you're already a little bit of a disadvantage. So if you come off boring, if you come off not fun, you know, if you're not really that, that charismatic as a leader to them, then you're, you're at a huge disadvantage. So you've got to do all these things and really put something out there that makes it exciting for them to come work for you and be a part of what you're doing. And a lot of times we listen to calls of people that we work with and where they're interviewing people and they just can't get anybody to come on. And you listen to the interview and you're like, dude, would you, would you be excited by what you just told this person? You know, mm -hmm. so how you paint that picture for them, um, it's, it's huge. It's a big, big part of being successful at that. But there are steps that are important. Again, we don't have time to go through the whole thing today, but you know, the, the hiring process is critical to make sure you end up with good hires that are successful and not just people that are an expense. And this is simply a screenshot of the third page of our 14 page hiring mm -hmm. packet that breaks down our 12 step hiring process. Lots of hoops, 
lots of steps to jump through at the, at each stage, if they don't make it past the stage, you got to cut them out of the candidate mm -hmm. pool, mm -hmm. right? Eliminating bad hires is almost as important as making good hires. How many of y'all raise your hands, which we can't see y'all. Somebody asked earlier, can you see us? Am I muted? This is a webinar. We can't see you or hear you, but how many of y'all have ever made a bad hire? And you kept them on for months and months and months. <laughs> Todd's Preach. raising two hands. Preach. Two hands, right? What a colossal waste of money and time. Yeah. So eliminating bad hires is almost as important as making good hires. But this is our 12-step hiring process. We actually have three courses around our staffing, hiring, and onboarding. We're going to fly through some of those slides. And then we're going to get to... Uh, your questions and answers here in just a few minutes. We want to have enough time for Q and A. Yeah, before we go, really quick though, mm -hmm. look, one of the biggest things that people miss when they're hiring people, guys, you have to set standards and expectations, mm -hmm. right? You got to be clear about that. You can't just hire people like I used to do years ago and just throw them in the deep end of the pool, you know, and hope that they could swim, and then they drown, and you drag them out, and you go do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. You got to like set the tone. You got to tell them exactly, not just from a results perspective. But an activity perspective, what do they have to do every day? What do those standards mm -hmm. look like? And make sure that you're getting good body language and good feedback when you talk about those things. That's the number one area where people miss out. And then probably number two is just finding out what's important to them, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about that in just a second when we get to accountability. I need to know what's important to them. What do they want to accomplish? Because I don't think I really can motivate anybody. I think motivation comes from within. But if I can find out what's important to you, then I can help you come up with a plan to make that happen. And together, you know, we can move down that road and, and hopefully you'll be successful. But make sure you do those things as you go through the hiring process. Don't just hire people because they got a pulse and they take your comp plan and <laughs> you think they got a great personality. You need a lot more than that. So, yes, you know what's going to happen? You're going to weed out a lot of people. You're going to tell a lot of people no. And it might get a little frustrating when you do that. But I would much rather end up with successful hires than people just to fill a chair well, and end up having a deal for all that, that that comes with it. Todd, you want to jump in? Yeah, something that I noticed, you know, talking to thousands of agents over the last few years and really diving into every type of agent out there is that a lot of agents think that they need somebody right now. And, you know, I have a sales problem and they hire a, a warm body or somebody they think is really good. And then I hear, Todd, they suck. So I fired them. <laughs> and I go, okay, what are their, you know, what, what were they doing? What, was, what, was, what did you have them doing? And what I found out, long story short, is that a lot of agents, they're not setting up that person for success. Like, oh, I hired them to be a producer, but I wanted them to go generate all of their own leads. Like, you just hired an agent with a subcode. Like, what do you <laughs> Like, I understand that the age that your producers need to get referrals and they need to work centers of influence. Like that should be a given, but like, you can't just throw them in and tell them to be their own agency under underneath you. Like there was no system or marketing plan or nothing set up to help them be successful. That's why people spend, you know, I would love to open up a Chick-fil-A if there was one around me because the franchise model of success is there. Like day one, those franchise owners know how to how to take the playbook and run with it. If you don't have that playbook, or if you if you don't know what they should be doing every single day, you got to get that set up before you just waste money on payroll and waste your time and on the you know the wrong system. Good stuff, guys. Well, let's jump into compensation, right? How are we paying these people? What does compensation look like? We're actually going to go over a couple of examples. Do you want any high points on compensation? Yeah, look, I think compensation is how you get people to do what you want them to do. I mean, if you think about the carrier that you represent, they do the same thing with you, right? They've got incentives. They got compensation in place so that you help them reach their goals. This needs to be looked at the same way. And there's a lot of details into this. One question that comes up all the time, actually Todd and I talked about today that I wanted to just kind of bring up is, do I pay renewals or not, right? Mm -hmm. People ask that all the time, social media, they ask us, you know, should I pay renewals, you know, to, to get them interested in the retention of the people they wrote, all these different things that come up. Todd, you want to weigh in on, you know, maybe your experience with that and what you would recommend. I shot myself in the foot. <laughs> yeah. So what, what I was doing before, uh, I was making, you know, because I got I to gotta lead in real fast of how I got to this point. 
So I, I hired producers on, they were generating their own leads through basically their marketers slash producers. They were generating their own leads through my marketing systems, making the sell, and then I would have somebody else service it. But essentially I, I had all the systems in place to, to make my marketing costs pretty low and I allowed them to get renewals, right? So I felt like they were doing a lot of the, the grunt work and it was easier for me because I didn't have to hire a marketer and a producer. I was kind of hybriding the model and getting them really excited. Well, then, um, you know, with all the, the TCPA laws and how hard it is to telemarket and how expensive internet leads get and to telemarket those, uh, I, that's where I was like, okay, I got to switch my marketing up and now I'm going into direct mail. Well, the customer acquisition cost for direct mail is substantially higher because it's somebody calling you, right? Mm -hmm. the, the intent and the closing ratio is so much higher with direct mail, but a big problem started to happen, which is I'm paying my people way too much money to just sit there and answer the phone. And so now I'm in a catch 22 moment where I've got to figure out how to transition people who are high on the hog getting uh getting renewals to my new comp plan that the you know our company used to be really cognizant of growth now they're giving us variable comp on new business only and mm -hmm. they don't really care too much about growth of course they do but they, they just push in new business new business new business and if you get a producer who's used to renewals and getting a lot more money, but your marketing spend has to continue to increase or double, uh, you get yourself into a big bind. So going forward, I know that my comp plan is going to be more tied to new business production. And then any kind of bonus or renewal, if you want to call it that, is going to be tied to my bonus uh, plan at the carrier. So they get, it's basically, they get to participate with me in, in those things versus getting them excited about new business commissions and driving that growth that I need in order to hit the variable comp. So. Yeah, I think that's the way to do it, you know, and, and what we've done through the years is position um, incentives and bonuses throughout the year mm -hmm. that help us accomplish what we need at the end of the year. And what I mean by that is sometimes agency owners, um, they'll pay their team based off some annual bonus that they get. And what you have to understand is that when you roll out what you think is a really exciting, you know, annual opportunity in January, which is when most people do it, and it doesn't get paid until maybe January or February of the next year, it might as well be 15 years from now. Mm -hmm. They're more concerned about next Friday than they are next February, right? Because it's just so long. So <laughs> what you need to do is come up with programs and bonuses that get people excited about right now that hopefully gets you on pace for what it is that you're looking for at the end of the year and not necessarily pay them on what your final results are. I know some people are like, well, you're just being selfish with your bonus or whatever. Not really, because I'm paying that money out as I go throughout the year. And actually, I'm the one taking the risk that we end up where we need to end up because exactly. you could have some good months in there, maybe not have a great year. But if you do it right, you, you most of the time you are going to end up where you where you want to be. And I love participation bonuses where, you know, the group has a goal. And the goal is to say for easy numbers, say it's 100. And then everybody that participates in that, whatever percentage of that goal that they hit, that's the percentage of the bonus that they get. So if you say we're going to give a thousand bucks, if we hit 100 and someone does 30%, if they do 30 of the 100, then they get 30% of the thousand dollars. And that keeps everybody engaged all throughout the month. It rewards the people that do the most, you know, and people don't give up because they're not, quote, on pace you know, to hit their individual level, it may just be lower than what someone else is. So look, I think comp, you know, and we can show the comp plans that we have in here, tiered approaches based off volume is, is the best way to do it. Don't overpay your underperformers or underpay your overperformers. And, and what I mean by that is sometimes the gap is just not that big. You could have somebody that's like the lowest producing person in the agency and someone who's absolutely crushing it and the difference in total comp between those two people is not very much. So you need tiers that are representative of what they're doing. And don't be afraid to pay out more than what they're bringing in. They're helping you scale that business. You know, the average consumer, average customer stays with a captive agency for about seven years, 7.2 years. I'm not sure exactly what it is on the independent side. But if you think about seven years, right? And let's say you lose money in years one or two, or maybe even years three, 
you're still making it in four, five, six, and seven. And you're, you're, you're using them to help you scale the business. So don't be afraid to pay it a little bit more, especially for those that are crushing it because they're only representing one salary, right? So we have some people here that are, you know, they're the top end of these scales you see here in just about every month and they're making a lot of money, right? But they're only representing one salary. Whereas if I got to go hire four or five or six other people to do the same amount of work, now I've got to pay four or five, six people salaries, right? And there's pros to cons and pros and cons having that type of situation. I get that. But having high standards, getting the most out of people, getting, recent, getting them to reach their full potential where they make the most amount of money for them and their families, that's always worked really well for us. So Joseph can kind of go through maybe a little bit more detail. These, these comp plans that we have on here, these are all on our platform. Um, we change them up based off of, you know, grids and tiers that the companies come out with. But as and it just kind of in a nutshell, it's all tier based. So the more they do, the more they make. And yeah, there may be some qualifiers that you can put in there based off certain things that are important to you and the success of your agency. Um, but having that approach versus just a flat number for everybody, this works, this works much, much better. Yeah. And I like having multiple tiers, not just two, three, four. We want to have many rungs on the ladder and a high total. When we made this original comp plan, we didn't have anybody that ever written 151 in a month, right? We had had uh, agents writing 100 to 120 very consistently, other agents writing 80 to, to 100 policies, and our lower tier agents writing 40 to 60. That's kind of our minimum expectation is at least 40, 40 policies a month. Um, but guess what? We've had producers now hit 151 plus. So have high ceilings and opportunities, not capped. Um, what's important is when you're pitching this to a candidate that we're not just saying, I'm going to give you a $28,000 salary or a $36,000 salary plus this commission scale. That's hard for them to visualize. So that's why over to the right, when I'm recruiting a candidate, when I'm interviewing a candidate and going over this compensation plan, I'm focusing on the far right column, the total opportunity. So for us, we use the items or policies example down here. So I'll let a producer know if you're averaging about two uh, two a day, hitting around 50 a month, that's about a $65,000 opportunity. I show this to someone that's making $14 an hour at Victoria's Secret right now, or making, you know, $13 an hour at the State Farm or another carrier's <clears throat> agency down the street, plus $10 an item. I show them this, their mouths drop. But if I just say it's this salary plus this randomized commission scale, they don't really visualize it. I want to sell and pitch the entire opportunity, but also show them the massive upside potential. We have team members making $120,000 to $150,000 a year as producers. We also have team members making fifty dollars to sixty. dollars right? We have, a, we have a wide range, but our top producer, Beth, writes 150 items a month on average. She's hitting 200 two or three times. She's been writing over 100 items a month since May of 2014, I think. Right. She's only missed 100, maybe six times in the past six years. She makes amazing money. I show them that, but I also show them other average yeah. producers. I don't want to be like a manager, a hiring manager that shows you a spreadsheet. It's like, look, Todd, you open this farmer's agency. You're going to be worth $10 billion in three years. All you got to do is buy six leads a day. No, I want to be realistic. I want to be realistic, but show them the opportunity. Todd, I'm curious, what are your thoughts about this and or what do you do maybe differently for your comp plans for your team members? So this is in line with what I'm going to. Um, more upfront commission, you know, if if the average agent makes 10% in in premium from their their agent or their their carrier, but then they have an optional variable comp plan where they might get double that, let's say if they hit goals, this is a lot of agents are, are looking probably at this and going, well, shoot, I'm paying a salary and I'm giving a hundred percent commission. Well, if you tier it properly to ensure that you hit the variable bonus, mm -hmm. right, then, then you're basically possibly going to break even if, if they're hitting the right tiers, because now your, your marketing spend is covered and they're helping you hit the, the variable. So this is exactly in line with what I'm changing my comp plan to. Um, something else that I wanted to bring up that I had kind of a light bulb moment um, is I know that there's agents, if you're in a high premium area, and so a, a producer could make a lot of commission, I'm sorry if you're not in a high premium area with what I'm about to say, but like I've heard agents recruiting um, producers in low premium states to work in high premium states because of 
the, the comp plan availability. So we were talking about working remote. Um, that's, that's an avenue that people can go down here. If that makes sense. Yeah. I'm trying, not, I'm trying not to beat up on the low premium states. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. And another couple of things just real quick about this comp plan. Number one, you don't have to use the exact same tiering that you see here. You change these numbers up based off your agency. So everybody's going to be a little bit different, different spot. But what I will say, and what Joseph mentioned earlier, make sure the top tier is something that you've never done before. Don't have, if, if your average people are, are writing say 40 a month and your top tier is 40, well, then they've arrived, right? There's no need to try any harder. There's no need to learn anything new. There's no need to do anything different. They're, they're already capped out. Don't do that. Have tiers that are above what they're doing now. So they always have something to shoot for and they constantly get better and better and better. And then don't be afraid to go in here and actually change the numbers so that, you know, it meets your situation a little bit better. This is just simply, you know, what we're using. A lot of people are using these exact numbers, but it may not be a good fit for you. And that's okay. So I'm going to fly through some of these slides real quick and then get to Q&A. Okay. Um, we have a service team generated bonus example. We like to pay our service team members for generating sales opportunities to pass to our sales agents. You might want your CSRs, customer service representatives, to quote it and write it as well, which is fine. And maybe they're on a hybrid type commission scale. Mm -hmm. But y'all, generating sales from service is a huge missing opportunity for many agencies. No question about it. They're, you know, they're taking calls, inbound opportunities, or people already know them. They've got a relationship with them. They set time aside, and then nothing happens except for the transaction. you got to teach your people, you know, moving forward, we, we've got to find out what they don't have, and we've got to get that here. And we teach a process where they basically do a, a mini review, you know, to earn the right to talk about that other line and not just bring up the discount. So we do pay based off the results, and this works extremely well for us. And if you think about it, your marketers or your sales producers, they're busting their hump all day, mm -hmm. making 70, 80, 100, 150 phone calls a day to talk to six people. Your customer service agent just picks up the phone and talks to somebody that already has a relationship with your agency. I don't know how bundled your book is, but the more bundled your book is, the more multi-lining you have within your book, the more profitable it'll be. That's why we're able to run so lean. Mm -hmm. Y'all, over 53% of our customers here at this agency have an umbrella. Think about that for a minute. Over 53% have auto, property, and umbrella, plus toys like motorcycles, boats, ATVs, things like that. That's huge. Auto and property is well over 80%. How bundled's your book? If you're writing a lot of monoline business, you're going to be losing out on a ton of profitability. Let's get your service team members or sales team members who are taking service calls, generating more sales and reward them. Craig mentioned monthly bonuses. Here's a couple examples. You know, like this would be like a bonus pot type thing. If they can see hit 350 items, it's a thousand dollars. If they hit 500 items, three thousand dollars all based on participation, like he said. So if we hit, say, 500 items and someone did 40% of that, they would get $1,200. Hey, that's not bad for a boy from Alabama. I did that math in my head, y'all. So that's the bonus pot opportunity, plus maybe some individual incentives. So if they hit a certain number, they earn an extra amount. If we're trying to get a certain activity, like life appointments or conversations, maybe bonusing a little bit for that. Certain lines of business, like standard auto is what we call our line 10. That's our standard auto. So just examples of monthly bonuses. These aren't things that are done every month. Right. It would be done maybe three or four times a year, right? Something like that based on need. It's not a contract. It's not set in stone. And when the opportunity is there, we want them to take it. We want them to seize it. Now let's talk about expectations and accountability. So I wish we had more time. Do we have three more hours? We need three more hours today. I know Thursday. we have another session on Thursday, <laughs> but holding people accountable to your minimum expectations is important. So here we have our pyramid of minimum expectations. This is for Craig Wiggins agencies. We're looking for at least two items a day. Now these are minimum expectations, not goals. Our goals for producers are three to four items a day. We want them writing 60 to 80 items a month minimum. We have multiple producers that write 100 plus. This is our minimum expectation. See, those are different numbers. Minimum, goal, opportunity. Those are three different numbers. If you hire people and say, yeah, we want to shoot for around two items a day, don't be surprised when we're only doing one or two mm -hmm. and not hitting three, four, or five. So two items a day or 
10 quotes, which is four to five households quoted in a day, auto property and umbrella, or 80 calls. As long as they're putting forth the effort, they're coachable, mm -hmm. they're working hard, we can work with that for a time. But if they end up not getting the production, it's just not going to work long term. But this is something, y'all, that we're going through with them in the interview. Mm -hmm. We make it crystal clear in the interview process, in the hiring process, what our expectations are. And that way, that way there's no shock or surprise when we start trying to hold them accountable. Todd, I think you wanted to mention some things about accountability. Would this be a good opportunity? Well, yeah. I mean, one of the big problems that I was having in, in my office, you know, I was out running a, a direct mail company and a tech company. So I, I let especially my service team basically do whatever they want, right? Because I, I, I listened to their calls. I coached them. The people that I was more focused on was my producers at the time. And, you know, I hired in a couple more CSRs. I turned two of my CSRs. And when I hired the new ones in, I, I coached them and mentored them for the, for the first 30, 60 days. And then for a solid year, I realized, you know, our, our retention last year dipped. And, you know, initially I thought, well, it's because I have two new sales or two new CSRs in there. And whenever I went and checked, they were doing the, the activities, but I never went and listened to their calls. I was always listening to my salespeople's calls. And when I saw that the activities were being done and I didn't go in and hold them accountable with a better review process of uncovering needs or uncovering opportunity, that was the number one issue. And so I have, I have a whole lot of things that I need to implement on our service team, holding them accountable for uncovering opportunities, because you're absolutely right. They're picking up the phone with a relationship, right? They're not busting their hump, uh, outbound dialing like crazy. So that, that's the big uh, you know, hole in my agency that I found recently was, was on the service team side. We got good news for you and for everybody here. We have a whole section on Craig Wiggins Coaching's on demand platform on service team training, including reviews and generating sales from service and increasing retention. But as you see, expectations and accountability go both ways, yep. right? I can't just show a team member this once and expect them to, to meet these minimum expectations. You got to have daily conversations if they're not on track weekly individual sessions, a part of the weekly team meetings, holding your staff accountable is not something you should do at the, on Fridays or like once a month. We don't like people say, what's your annual review process? Yes, on our platform and our documents, we have an employee evaluation form um, that, that you can complete with your, with your team members. We don't really have an annual no. review process. No. It's more of like a daily, weekly, monthly. Are you on track or not? If not, we roll up our sleeves and we get to work with them. We coach them. We develop them. We help them with their marketing plans and strategies to help them achieve their goals. We don't just give them a phone book and say, hey, figure it out. Right, go get some sales. And one other thing I'd add to this about expectations and accountability, you know, how you start people off makes a huge difference. You know, I, I can remember years ago when we'd, we'd hire people and just kind of like, hey, go do the best you can and let's see what happens. Or maybe, maybe an agency has a probationary period where they feel like it's going to take someone 90 days to learn how to be productive. What happens when you do that is you set people up really for mediocrity, if not failure because they come in and they just kind of do the same thing every day, which really isn't leading to a whole lot. And they think this is fine. And before you know it, they've got habits and they've got mm. patterns and behaviors. And then trying to fix that, you know, three months down the road, once you realize, oh crap, they're not doing a whole lot, it's a problem. So we try to give them a goal and you could do this in your agency, whether it's three, five, 10 policies or items, the very first week, like, look, you've got to hit these things, the first four weeks, the second month, the third month, we got to get you start off on the right foot. And as long as you talk, like when Todd was talking earlier about supporting them, you know, with marketing, with training, the resources that they need, there's no reason why they can't make those things happen. Um, it's important that you do that, though, because if you don't, again, you bring them in and you say, hey, let's just let's just try to try to get you up to speed over the next three months. Three months is going to go by really quick. They're not going to add a lot of contribution. And before you know it, now they've got these patterns and these habits, and it's really hard to go back and unring that bell. But if you start them off the very first day, the very first week mm -hmm. with a sense of urgency about getting going, whatever level that is, you're, you're going to find that's going to work a lot better. Yeah. Getting them rolling quickly. I really can't stand when an owner says, you know, I've got a new producer. They've only been with us for about nine months. 
<laughs> I'm like nine months in insurance. They should already be balding, right? They should, that's a long time in insurance, right? We got to get them up and running quickly. So here's how we do it. Mm -hmm. We actually have these minimum production expectations, minimum production requirements after their initial training and onboarding. I don't care, y'all, if your minimum is two policies in the first week, if it's just themselves, which I hope they are their first customer. They should be their first customer, assuming that they qualify. But their own friends, family, personal network, leads that they bring into the agency. I don't care if it's just two policies in the first week. Something has to hit the board. There may be three in the second week, third in the fourth week. What we're trying to do is we're trying to ramp up over the first three months, getting our producers to that pyramid of two items a day. But it's rare that they're not hitting that in the first month. Our, for our producers are hitting 50, 60, 70 policies typically in their first month. We've actually had him hit 100 in their first month. Mm -hmm. And the last hire we made, he did 22 his first week. Wow. He was a chef before he came into this business. His restaurant had closed down because of COVID, mm -hmm. changed industries altogether. He did 22. Now, would he have ever done 22 the first week? And seven of those were umbrellas, by the way. Would he have ever done that had we not had that expectation in place? Probably not. He probably would have gone through Friday, maybe wrote himself, Maybe wrote a couple of his friends, but that would have been it, you know. And and I think that's that's what we're talking about is getting them set up with a sense of urgency. We got to get rolling. We got to create habits. We got to create behaviors, you know, that they carry with with them through the rest of their career. Mm -hmm. um, one last slide, and then we're going to spend like fifteen minutes on Q and A. We have so much more to go over Thursday, like Candace sent in the chat. What about leads? Like how, how many leads are you getting for this production? All that kind of stuff. What leads are you using? That's what we're going to go over on Thursday. And Todd's going to be a big part of that because he does so much leads, including direct mail through his awesome company, smarketingmail.com. So Thursday, same time, same link. We're going to go over so much more on actually selling more business. We had to mm -hmm. start with your team, mm -hmm. right? You can have amazing systems, amazing processes, fantastic lead sources, but if you don't have the team in place to work it, that's not going to work. And conversely, you can't have too many team members without having systems and processes and marketing plans in place. So that's what we're going to talk about on Thursday. Before we do, one quick reminder for those of you that jumped on late. By the way, some of y'all sent me chats like Melissa, a couple others. Y'all jumped on a little bit late. This recording is going to be sent to everybody that registered for the class this one and Thursday. So have no fear. If you missed something, had to jump on a little late, maybe you had to jump off a little early on Thursday or something, that's totally fine. But one last mention of our program, craigwilliamscoaching.com slash on demand. Through Friday at 5 p.m., we've got the 2022 success program, uh, success promo code out there. It's 20 bucks. Y'all try us out. Check us out. You'll have full access to our whole platform, our next live training sessions for the next four weeks, all of the 100 plus documents and processes for 20 bucks. I think, I think it would be worth you checking us out. And maybe it'll be like the other 1,500 agencies that are in our program that stick with us for a long time. But with that said, we got to get to Q&A. And we have about 15 minutes right, to do it. let's do it. So please feel free to send a chat or uh, submit a question here. Uh, Max uh, had asked that. We're going to go over leads on Thursday. Cody said, I see a thousand calls a month as our minimum expectation. Have you guys ever tried working with a call center to make those calls? So we do some live transfers. I don't know if Todd does as well, but for them to meet those minimum commission tiers, right? Assuming that they don't have a high number of production, they got to make 50 calls a day. And honestly, if a producer is not making 50 calls a day, they're not going to work out. No. They're not going to work out. Um, Todd, anything you want to chime in? Yeah. I mean, outbound call, outbound dials and talk time for me. Um, you know, I, I like how you tier it, the pyramid. It's either the top or the middle or the bottom. But I always tell my people, hey, if you're selling a household a day, three or four items a day, I'm not going to bug you about 50 calls. 100%. Right? Like, I just want you to, we're, we're in this for sales. We're in this... So um, that's how you hold account accountability, though, because if there's no sales there and there's no dials, then we got a problem we got to talk about. Um, Donnie just asked, how do you track the leads that your service team generates for their bonus plan? So the leads are actually tracked in our lead managed system, which, by the way, for those of you with farmers, Agency MVP is a fantastic lead management system. Todd's also a little bit involved in that as well. Yeah. I don't know when Todd sleeps, but Agency MVP 
is fantastic. If you're with Allstate, Allstate Lead Manager or MVP, or there's others that even Allstate agents or independents can use, but MVP is fantastic. What we do is we have our service team as a source. They're a source. So like if somebody generates a cross sell for Beth to work, she adds it to the lead management system, but the source is um, Susan. Susan's one of our CSRs. When she sells it, she remembers that Susan was the source. So in our sales tracking system, we put Susan as the source. So we pay her the bonus. So we just simply have them as a source for the lead manager system and a source for our sales tracking system. That's how we keep up with that. Um, some people were asking about remote, working remotely. How does that work with licenses? And thank you to those that kind of chimed in. If you hire somebody in a different state, as long as they get a non-resident license mm -hmm. in your state, they can sell products in your state. Todd, is that still true for farmers as well? Just point of clarification, you can have team members all across the country, but they have to have a Texas uh, non-resident license, of course. That's right. right? Yep. But they can anywhere. be anywhere. If they, as long as they're in the United States, they're good with it. Fantastic. Um, let's see here. Jason said or asked, are producers calling mainly requotes, cross sales, or they also get data leads to call on? If so, how many data leads a day per producer? We'll talk more about that on Thursday, all the various lead sources, Jason. So make sure to, to tune in to that. Uh, we're going to talk about requotes, win backs, cross sales, internet leads, live transfers, direct mail. We're going to hit all that really hard on Thursday. I'll, I'll tap into a lot of targeting as well. I think that's where I bring a lot of Definitely. effort. Yeah, what zip codes to hit, where you need to be spending your marketing dollars, not wasting money in areas where you're not competitive. Todd is the man, and that's where MVP comes into play, agency MVP for sure. Uh, Randy is on the call. He says, I've been with CWC for three or four years. I'm on this call as a refresher. If you're not a part of CWC, give yourself an early Christmas <laughs> present and join CWC. You won't regret it. Randy, thanks, dude. Appreciate you, Randy. We appreciate you, man. Um, Nicole says, Indeed won't give us access to resume alerts. You know, if any others do something similar. Uh, Nicole, what carrier are you with? Send me a chat. I don't know what you mean. I, I have I help people sign up for Indeed resume search alerts all the time. Farmers. She says farmers. Hmm. Now, I, I don't, maybe it's because farmers has a corporate account or something like that. But as an individual, I could sign up right now in about three yeah. minutes with my Gmail account to, to create that. So I don't know. Um, I'm not really sure. Don't put in your farmer's email, oh, says Alexandra. So I would probably use your Gmail or, so, or something like that. I'm assuming that doesn't break any problems with compliance or anything, right? I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, but like, why would it? Exactly. I don't know. Recruiting. What about. Yeah, you're just having a separate <laughs> account. Um, good idea. Thanks. Okay, Nicole, you're oh. welcome. Um, Zach Timmerman said agency MVP is a game changer. I would be lost without it. That's awesome. That's great feedback, Zach. Yeah, Zach. Uh, let's see here. By the way, Merry Christmas. Use both CWC and Smarketing. Just purchase a second agency. Awesome, Jason. I'm at 3.5 million on my way to five. Jason, keep growing, man. Good job, Jason. That's right. awesome. Um, let's see here. Monica Diaz asks, how do you communicate? This is good. How do you communicate a new comp program and new expectations with an agency producer that you've had on for a year already? Without lowering their morale, they don't meet their original expectations and also made a mistake with compensation structure to begin with. Good question. This happens a lot. You know, and right now, luckily, you're at a really good time to do it, right? Because January 1st is right around the corner. Sometimes people are expecting change. Um, I'm a Band-Aid kind of guy, right? I'm not, I'm not one that's like, hey, let's ease into this. Because a lot of times when you ease into it, the ones you're going to lose, you're going to lose them anyways. You're just going to lose them a lot slower. Um, so I just ripped the Band-Aid off. It's like, look, here's what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And that's it. You know, and, and I, I try to sell it based off what the opportunity is and what they can get out of it. But at the end of the day, look, the, the main thing is that you learn from it for next time. Right. We've all made those mistakes. We've made bad hires. Um, a lot of times, the, frankly, the vast majority of the time, it's on us because of the questions that we ask or don't ask the conversations we have or don't have, you know, so we need to learn every time we make a bad hire, someone doesn't work out, but when you got to make a comp plan, you know, I'm just a firm believer that we go in there and we rip the bandaid off and here's what it's going to be. And don't allow them to hold you hostage. You know, years ago when, when I was around $5 million in premium, um, I had somebody in the agency that was pretty toxic 
And I felt like, well, what I need to do is just kind of hire my way out of it. I'll just keep hiring people. And one day I'll get big enough where I won't need her anymore. And, and I can get rid of her. The problem was everybody else that I brought in, she just infected those people. And one day we're literally sitting at a, at a meeting in, in a morning meeting and I'm trying to implement something and I don't even remember what it was, but her reaction to it was, was very toxic. And then as I'm looking around the room, they all pretty much had the same reaction. And I just asked the question, my guys, is any, anybody willing to, to go along with this? Nobody was. So I decided just to terminate all of them and I just fired everybody and I started over. So I'm sitting, I'm sitting there $5 million, right? And I'm, I'm by myself. And yes, it was difficult to go through that. And it was tough for the next few months as I, as I staffed back up. And luckily, my dad still had an insurance license. So I had him come in and help me answer the phones. But what it taught me was, don't let people hold you hostage. Mm -hmm. If they're not a good fit, they need to go. If you have to change comp plans to, to fix a problem because people aren't doing what they need to do and they end up quitting, let them quit. Let them move on. But learn from it so the next time when you bring somebody aboard, you bring on board the right way and they end up being successful. So don't be afraid of what might or might not happen with your team. You know, if they, if they leave, they leave. You can still, you can run the agency by yourself if you have to, right? And sometimes people leave is not always a bad thing. So I think when it comes time to make a comp change, just make the change. And right now it couldn't be any better on the timing because you're about to enter a new calendar year anyways. Well, and yeah, I was about to put you on the spot, Todd. If you're going to be making some changes, how are you going to be doing it? <laughs> well, I mean, if you're making a comp change to existing employees, you can use an average production in the past to then help help transition. So for my people to get them off of the, the renewals, I'm going to transition them to a comp plan on the new business side that enhances, enhances the commissions to where next year they should at least make the same amount of money if they produce the same amount of effort this year. So yeah, like like our carriers do to us, they're able to take off that backside renewal and give it to us in the new business. Um, you know, and that that's it should work just as as well as it did for us. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to start peeling it away on the backside to give it in the front side. And look, one other thing on that, guys, we'll go to the next question. Find out what they want. Mm -hmm. Find out what motivates them. Find out what their goals are. If I've got somebody that wants to buy a house, that wants to pay off debt that wants to send their kids to a certain school, then what I can do is take my average premium, my comp plan, and I can come up with a plan together to help make that happen for them, right? Now, when I hold them accountable, it's not a confrontation. It's just a conversation about what it is they're trying to do to begin with, right? So when you're, if you're changing comp plans, show them that. Say, look, for you to get where you need to go, this is what you're going to have to do, right? And I'm going to come in here and I'm going to be the accountability partner with you to help make that happen. Right. Showing people that you care about their success, you know, financially, that's a huge part of being a good leader anyways. But that's the best way to get people to do, you know, what you're trying to get them to do. If it's all about you, it's all about the agency, your bonus, those kind of things. But people don't care about that. Right. I mean, do you care how much the CEO of your carrier makes every year? I don't. You know, they care about what's important to them. So you got to you got to keep that in mind as you work with them going forward. Oh, one last question. Uh, Jose says, what advice would you give to someone who has great ideas and effective goal setting, but can't execute? They just sit in their chair all day, lacking the drive to execute on their ideas. And I'm assuming he's talking about a team member. Well, look, I, th I think when it comes to goals, the true goal for anything should not be the result. The true goal should be focusing on the process that leads to the result. So for an example, let's say I've got a, a team member here and they're trying to get 100 in a month, right? That's the result. The goal is what they have to do every day to put themselves in a position to quote enough people with their close rate where at the end of the month, they end up with 100, right? So what I should be doing is I work with them and this can go for yourself too. You know, if you're trying to set a goal for yourself, your agency, personal goal, whatever it may be. Todd just lost a bunch of weight this year, right? How did he do that? He wasn't focused on the total amount of weight he needed to lose. Activity. He's focused every day on what he's got to do to lose that weight. Yep. It's the same thing in business. So when you have a goal, you know, a lofty goal, a long-term goal, a big goal, whether it's premium, whatever it might be, that's great. And those things need to be in place, but you will serve yourself a lot better if you focus on all the little things that need to be done to make that happen, to put yourself in a position to accomplish that goal. So that's what I would say. Reverse engineer that. 
take whatever that goal is that they're trying to accomplish and then break it down daily and look at what they need to do every day to make that happen. And they'll be much more likely to do so. It's that whole activity model. Like if you're not doing that, you should always focus on activity because if you come back at the end of the day and they haven't done anything and you're mad at them about the goal, like you said, it's, you're not driving the right mentality of the right accountability of doing the activities and then coaching those activities to, to get to the goal. Yep. That's right. hundred percent. Well, ladies, gentlemen, we're 90 minutes in. We want to get you guys back to work. I hope that you took a ton of notes, have a lot of great takeaways. There's going to be so much more on Thursday. It's going to be hard to cram it in, but we got another 90 minute session coming to you on Thursday. And I want to thank Todd for donating your time today to share you. your information. Craig, of course, and I'm so thankful, Joseph Puckett, to be able to, to spend this, this time with you all. Any final thoughts from you guys? Hey, look, I appreciate you guys being a part of the call today. I really hope that this helps you. You know, whether you join our program or not, I want people in this business to be successful. I can remember what it was like, you know, not being able to sleep at night and worried about where things are going to come from. And if, if we can make an impact, I know, like I said in the beginning of the call, that's what I admire about Todd. He's always willing to share and to help people, you know, so that's what these are about. And yes, we definitely would love to work with you in CWC. I know we could help you a lot, you know, help you get down that road a, a lot faster, but either way, I just want you to be successful. So thanks so much for joining. Todd, appreciate you donating, donating your time today. We look forward to seeing everybody on Thursday. Any final thoughts from you, Todd? I would just tell people to really take it, take it to heart, take it back to your office and, and, and self reflect. Yeah, and, I'll, and we'll, I'm excited to see you guys on Thursday. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be so much information. Thank you all so much. Now, let's get back to work. Y'all have a <laughs> yeah. great rest of the day. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.